had to double the character of Hawkeye. Yeah, yeah. I did um, Captain America Civil War and then Avengers a Infinity War, which Avengers. he ended up not being in. So I, um, <laughs> I kind of moved over to, to the evil side of things on that. Today's episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Inner West Hemp. Be sure to visit them online for all your CBD needs. This is the same company that I use daily from tinctures to rub-ons to CBD gummies. Some of their products are even USADA approved. Be sure to use the code JAMP, 15% off at checkout. What's up, guys? Today's guest is a professional stunt performer and tricking legend. Please welcome to the Jam Cast, Mr. Kyle McLean. Thanks for having me, man. What's up, dog? How are you? I'm good. How are you? Dude, I was worried you got here like 20 minutes early, and normally I'm worried we're going to talk about stuff we should talk about on the Jamcast, but... Uh, I thought we didn't. We filled the time, which <laughs> Jamcast after dark stuff, I like to call it. <laughs> the stuff we can't broadcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, man. Secret stuff. Yo, so real real quick check. I'm going to call you out. I didn't talk about this until until now. Are you wearing any Lulu right now? Uh, head to toe. <laughs> <laughs> Minus the shoes. Same here, dog. Same, same here, bro. Yeah, socks, uh, pants, underwear, shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, like, I was like, in honor of Kyle, we'll come fully fitted out, uh, head to toe as well, minus the shoes. Smart. You know, I did an inventory last week. Too much Lulu. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like, uh, like uh, the inventory for me is every time I do my taxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, I buy a lot of Lululemon and I eat a lot of food. Hey, it's comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. And it's delicious. I the don't food, have that. I don't have that shirt though. I need that one. This one? Yeah. yeah. I just yeah. got this one. You seen this one? Uh, this is like for post workouts, they say. Mm. Throw it on, sweat wicking. You know. <laughs> Come on, Lulu, hook up the sponsorship. <laughs> it's all tricking and stunts worse. Yeah, Lulu. Yeah. For reals. But for now, we gotta give a shout out to our sponsor, Inner West Hemp. I don't know if you saw. We picked up a CBD sponsor for the Jamcast. It's oh, pretty yeah. dope, dude. Do you use C B D at all? Yeah. Yeah, all the time. Post training or yeah. injuries at work or, you know, mm-hmm. just to relax. 100%. Less stress. <laughs> I know. I start the days with the tinctures nowadays. Just uh-huh. like cut the edge before LA traffic. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah, it's a great way to start the morning is sitting in LA traffic for Ooh. two hours. Best um, way to start your day. It's insane, man. But uh, welcome back. It's kind of funny. We were kind of kind of joking about it before we got here with uh, Connor because uh, this is Connor's first time meeting you. But uh we consider you like part of the LA fam, but you've been spending so much time working and over in Atlanta that uh, you're kind of just like a world traveler. At this a little point. bit of a nomad at this I point, know. you know. To be fair, though, you you do have two properties in Atlanta, so that is true. Say that kind of makes you a resident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I like the East Coast now. Still love the West Coast. That's true, but I mean, you're originally technically from the down south, so it's like I mean, not I'm too originally far. from Toronto. True, if we're going fully, yeah, yeah right? Toronto and then grew up in Texas, right? And then over to Florida for a very, very, short, little bit of very time. short stint in Florida and then out to LA yeah, for yeah. the last eight years or so, right? It's been crazy, man. And most recently, where did you just get back from? Because uh, I know you've just been traveling like... Well, we just thin. did the new Christopher Nolan movie, Tenet. Yes. And it is like his bond or whatever. So we traveled the whole world. We did like seven countries last year. No way. America, Italy, England, Estonia... India, Norway, and maybe one more. Holy crap. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Was there a country that was your favorite out of Dude, Atlanta? Estonia. Really? Yeah. First really? of all, I'd never heard of it. <laughs> you never heard of Estonia? <laughs> they're like, we're going to go to Estonia. And I was like, what country is that in, you guys? And they're like, that is the country. And I was like, hmm. I've definitely heard of Estonia at least, but. All right, they're only like there. 23 or 27 years old, <laughs> although I'm only 28. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, anyways. Yeah. But no, it was really cool. Um, I think that was the one we were least excited about. Okay. And it was the long one we were in the, we were there for 10 weeks. So it was our longest location. And nobody knew anything about it, and we showed up, and it was awesome. Where is it located? It's um, just south of Finland and Norway, okay. on the other side of the Baltic Sea. Totally. Yeah. And what was so cool about it? Oh, dude, it was just like, where we were was this crazy little medieval town. Okay. That just, like, hasn't been touched, and then it's building up all around it, and there's some little hipster areas and stuff, but, like, Dope. Um, just, first, I mean, it was kind of crazy, because when we were there was when it was, like, the really long days. So there was like an hour of darkness every day. The sun no was going way. down at like midnight, but then it was like starting to come back up at two. Like it was insane. It was something that none of us had ever experienced. It was really not helpful for the jet lag. Yeah. But um, <laughs> it's insane. I don't know. I think just I had really low expectations for it. And the people ended up being super awesome. And the food scene there was ridiculous. Wow. Um, and then, yeah, it was just fun. We also had like 50 guys out there. So that, you know, always helps when there's a big team. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
That's crazy, man. And Tenet is a, it's, it's gotten like a lot of praise from the trailer. Um, yeah. Obviously, you guys can't talk fully about it until it's out. But I don't uh, even know what happens in who, the band. Who were you? Uh, <laughs> what was your position on it? Uh, I was doubling Robert Pattinson on it. Cool. Um, which was really cool. Yeah. You've had the chance over the last few years to actually step out of what we call like an ND performer. For those out there that don't know, that's just a, a guy like a utility stunt performer, yeah. a nondescript stunt performer who plays all these roles. And you've gotten to actually jump into what we like to call like the one X role, like sure, yeah, yeah. the head stunt double and stuff like that. Um, before Robert Pattinson, what was uh, the most recent double job? Right before that would have been Hobbs and Shaw doubling Jason Statham. Jason Statham. Yeah. That's a fun one. Yes. And did you get to double him on Fast 9 also? Didn't do Fast 9. Okay. Um, oh, Fast 8? Fast 8. Was Correct. The Fast first 9, time I did it. just He has a shoulder. small cameo in Fast 9. Yes. And I don't know if he did any stunts or not. I don't know. Um, but you did do Fast 8. Yeah, I did Fast yeah. 8 with him. Okay. I did a couple commercials with him and then Hobbs and Shaw. Wow, that's super cool. And what's it like working with him as his double? Like, does he do the majority of his stuff minus the hard hits? Or Yeah, I mean, he he does it all, right? He does all the fights himself. So, so. Being a double for him is mostly, like, the R&D kind of side of it and, you know, working with, like, the director and the stunt coordinator and stuff and creating these scenes and trying to trying to come up with things that work for his skill set and these different things. And he wants to do it all himself, so, you know, catering it to him and, and kind of going in and testing things and making sure it's cool for him to do it. Um, but, yeah, then he doesn't do any of the hard hits. Yeah. And I think he used to a lot, you know. Um, and he's always game to do everything. Um yeah, you know, he didn't go through any of the glass or anything like that. You know, he's not super close proximity to any explosions of or course. riding on the back of the cars in Hawaii or anything like that, you know. Which which so. is like, a, which isn't a testament to him not wanting to. It is just like a safety factor. Yeah, a lot absolutely. Of people yeah, yeah. And he wants to, and he and he does a lot of the driving stuff. And, you know, he does everything that they'll let him do. Yeah. And, you know, some, you know, some things are just insurance. They can't. It's it's crazy. Yeah. I was on a Fast Seven. Actually, first our first filming day was the Rock versus Jason Statham fight, and on one of the first takes of the entire day, we tackle with our both of our doubles through a glass pane, and Tanawai literally had to go into emergency surgery yeah, yeah. from the from the glass. So it's like, yo, what if that was the Rock yeah, take one? Yeah, you can't <laughs> do that. You know, emergency surgery. There's, there's so. some things that you know on on Tenant. Um, we did a 220 foot descender off a building in Mumbai and you know, they're wow. never letting an actor do that. Also, they don't want to, you, yeah, know, you don't 100%. want to do that. And I was going to ask you, is there a, a gag of yours that stands out as far as uh, having double Jason was one that was like tricky or memorable in your mind or anything that stands out since he's such an action icon, you know? Yeah. Um, not one particular gag, but I'm, I really enjoyed in Hobbs and Shaw, his, his apartment fight. That's just him uh. versus the three guys. And, I think that one was just fun to create and um, actually got to do some stuff in that because it was one of the first times that you've really ever seen him take some damage in a movie. Yeah. You know, right. and, and he's, he's going through mode. walls and he's going through glass and all these different things. And so, yeah, that was cool to, to be able to step in for those small things because normally, you know, he's just the guy kicking ass and he's not taking any blows and this... He finally, you know, took some blows, and that, that was cool to be a part of that. Yeah, that's super cool. And you're, you're kind of right. Like, normally he's in God mode. It's like Jackie Chan's one of the few guys who, like, took a, takes punishment mid-fight scene. Sure, yeah. And that's what made him so, like, dope in his choreo, like, super humanized. Um, and then, obviously, besides Jason Statham, like, we would be remiss to not talk about the, one of the other guys you got to double who is a, a character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which is Jeremy Renner. Yeah. And you've got to double the character of Hawkeye. Yeah, yeah. I did um, Captain America Civil War. And then Avengers a Infinity War, Avengers. which he ended up not being in. So I, um, <laughs> I kind of moved over to, to the evil side of things on that. And on Infinity War, did a lot of mocap for the villains. Yes. And then when he reappeared in Endgame, stepped back in and did you know some Ronin stuff with him. And No way. Yeah, and that was pretty awesome. That's cool. Hey, O'Connor, I think we have a picture of the, the Hawkeye suit. Maybe try to pull it up. Uh, what was the... We've talked to like some of the other guys, like we had Danny Graham talk about the Black Panther suit. Mm -hmm. What was the Hawkeye suit like? Was it manageable? Was it yeah? Difficult it was to you wear? know it's, it wasn't super bad. So in 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 Civil War, the only thing that was bad about it is that I had one very very tan arm, and the rest of me was super. You know, so as as he's got the one arm that's totally. exposed, and like I one time I just got sunburnt, and I had like a lobster arm, but the rest of me was normal. But other <laughs> than that, I mean, his his suit isn't anything crazy. There's quite a few few layers that go on to keep the like the quiver on you and all that stuff yeah. um but it, it wasn't hard to move in or anything like that it was just kind of six or seven layers on on the t on your top half but wow. nothing like 
being in one of those panther suits. I don't without think. the mask That's, too, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, and I didn't have any brutal. vision impairment or anything like that. And then when we moved on to do the the Ronin costume, which was super comfortable and he's fully, you know, that was great. And then that was just limited visibility because they didn't want to show who it was until the end of the fight, you know, when he finally reveals that it's him as a ninja. Yeah. Um, but that suit was the same. It was super easy to work in. That's super cool. And now we've talked to, like, a bunch of the guys that have been a part of all, like, the MCU, the Marvel Universe, like, from the doubles to, like, James Young, who helped choreograph on some of them. Um, is there, like, a, a, a movie or a project, like, of those that stands out to you in your mind? Because for those that aren't in the business, those movies are so gigantic. They're, like, I don't know. It's hard to explain. Like, they're, like, bigger than normal movies. They're, like, their own, like machine mm -hmm. like it's insane like it takes on a life of its own and stuff like that and for the amount of time that you're on them and the amount of money that goes into them and the scope of these scenes where you have hundreds of performers in one scene um is there anything that stands out in your mind as one of the coolest marvel experiences yeah i mean um the when they opened up all the portals in endgame yes. and everyone came out um the big finale the big, the big scene. finale right and so yeah. I mean, there's a lot of cool things that happened on, on different movies, but that one was interesting, right? They had all 40 of the A-list cast members there on the same day, and they had this giant tent, and them and their doubles were all allowed to hang out in there, and then there was, like, another section for the ND stuff, and <clears throat> I don't even think I ever stepped on set when they did any of the Portal stuff, but just sitting in that tent with all of those people, fully dressed, too, right? You yeah. know, from all of these movies that you've been watching for 10 years or whatever, and they're all there. Damn. And just, like, watching them hang out as normal human beings, you know, and then, and then just sitting around, I don't know, it was, it was a surreal experience to be sitting there with all those people, knowing that they're about to shoot this final end battle that's going to kind of, you know, close this whole thing yeah. that, well, that we've been watching for so long, you know. That is pretty crazy. I can't even imagine what that's like being around all of them at the same time. But then the, the very first time I would say is um, on Civil War, when we went to do the initial clash yes. of the two different things, and that was my first really big movie. And first time being in, in Marvel, and there was a point where we're, we're standing there, it's all the doubles, and I'm standing next to somebody, I forget, I'm standing next to him, and I just look over, I'm like, is this, is this real? Like, <laughs> yeah. we're really about to do this? And you're looking at some of your friends, I remember I was supposed to run right at Heidi, because yes. we were going to, like, that's our initial thing, I'm just, like, looking at my friend 100 yards away, and it's, like, looking around, they're, like, and action, and we're all running at each other to do this clash, the first time you see these guys, like, you know, fighting with each other, they've, they've been a family for so long, and that was... It was a surreal experience for sure. Yeah, it's super crazy. And did you always have dreams of uh, wanting to do stunts or being in TV and film? Not really, you know. Um, I always just loved doing martial arts and then tricking. Of course. And um, I wanted to continue doing that. And then, you know, throughout after high school and through a process of trying to figure out how to make this all work, you know, Danny and Anise and Jeremy and some of those guys introduced me to stunts and then I ended up loving it. Yeah. You know, um, it was never on the radar until one day it was. And I was like, I never even thought of this. Yeah, you it's know? crazy. But I kind of wanted to, to ask you that just uh, just simply so other kids out there could hear that because like you don't necessarily have to grow up thinking you're going to do this for your entire life. You could make even. a conscious decision listening to this podcast right now that you want to pursue stunts. Sure. Uh, and look where it can take you. Absolutely mm -hmm. insane. Yeah. You can wear Lululemon all day you, and buy houses in Atlanta. You, <laughs> <laughs> you could do that. <laughs> you too. You, uh, <laughs> oh, that's awesome, man. No, but it's stunts is uh it's been an insane blessing for all of our lives, that's for right. sure. Um and over the course of like the last few years, um, like obviously we're talking about a lot of specific highlights, but um is there a job that stands out to you as like you kind of realized that you were going to do this for the rest of your life, for lack of a better, you know, term. Like, because I know when you first moved to LA, you started doing like live shows, mm -hmm. and like you did the the stuff that we did, like the live shows, the tricking, the music vids, TV. Yeah. Um, was there a turning point for you where you realized, like, okay, I could really make this my career? Yeah, maybe on Avengers. Okay. Um, because that was when there was a a shift in the thought process that it wasn't just about performing anymore. And so on Avengers, right, we were, we were there for such a long time, and we were there before any real script was there, and it was, like, really just a... Pre-prep. The pre-prep yeah. and all of this stuff, and realizing that, like, as a, as a team, we are creating all this action for this movie and doing all these things that aren't just performing. And, and we had a whole team that came in to do that, 
and then they brought in all the doubles and everything. And so it was cool to be a part of this this pre prep team that kind of came in and got everything started for everybody else. Like this is what we're going to do. And then they brought in the guys that were actually going to double and do all these different things. I think at some point during Avengers, there was a switch where it was like, I don't just want to be a stunt performer anymore. I want to be a filmmaker. Yeah, you know, and and be a part of that that whole process from from start to end. It's definitely a, a huge switch. I had, I had a point in my career when I was doing the same thing. I used to enjoy just like showing up, taking the checks, go home, show up, take the checks, mm-hmm. go home. And then at a certain point you were realize like you could be a bigger part of this whole process because yeah. this stuff lives forever. That's like the craziest thing about our job. Is it like my friends not to downplay any of their jobs as, you know, accountants and yeah, doctors yeah. saving the world and stuff. But it's like, they don't have a highlight reel of like, yeah. Their best tax yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but like you know, we could look up our stuff for the rest of time. For it's sure, yeah, films cool. forever, right? Yeah, it's crazy, man. And so, like, you kind of touched on it and segued into it, and like, obviously, one of the reasons we have to have you on here is to just talk about the influence you've had not only on the stunt world but also upon the tricking community. Um, how long ago did you start martial arts and your martial arts journey, and then when did your tricking journey begin? So. I was maybe seven. We were still in Canada, and I wanted to do martial arts. And I just begged my mom for a long. I want to do martial arts. I want to do martial arts. I want to be a ninja turtle. I want to be a ninja turtle. You know. And then, uh, so then finally convinced her, and we went. And I did martial arts for like a year and a half in Canada before we moved to Texas. And in that time, I was like, this isn't quite what I thought. We're not learning how to do flips or anything like that, you know, because yeah. I kind of had the wrong idea of what I wanted to do. But anyways, <laughs> then we ended up moving to Texas, and. Um, just so happened that one of the instructors there that was only a couple years older than me was into, you know, doing some flips and stuff. And I was like, this is exactly what I want. So I'm still going through, you know, the martial arts stuff and all this. But I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm learning how to flip. And I'm in my backyard teaching myself how to do aerials and backflips and stuff. And then, you know, that definitely became like where a lot of the passion was is more of the tricking. And we didn't even know what tricking was yeah. then yet. You know, some I sure didn't. And then... um you know, so then I was doing that for a couple of years and one of my instructors was like, you should start competing. And so then we started doing local circuits around Texas and it was like, oh, there's other people doing, you know, these flips and stuff. And yeah. it was, you know, and then slowly started to find out about tricks, tutorials and bylang and all these different things. And then it just snowballed, you know, out of control. And I, I linked up with some other guys in Texas, like G-Dong and Sesh, yes. who were, you know, just starting to start a scene in Texas. And then I think 05 was my first gathering wow. in Texas. No way. And because of that, my parents then started letting me to go to ones outside of Texas. And so then I was in like New York and then just doing all these things. And it just, you know, tricking just became like the main passion in life. That's wild. So when do you think you officially start tricking? Like, I'd say 2000 probably, right? When we moved Holy crap. to Texas is when I was like, you know, starting to at least attempt these things, you yeah. know? And then I'd say like, oh, two is when I realized what was, you know, that this was a larger thing than just, yeah, yeah. oh, doing like a backflip in your karate form. It was like, oh, wait, there's people all around the world doing this. And some of them don't even have a martial arts background, you know, it's a very small community at the time. Now it's huge, yeah. right? That's crazy. And what's crazy is that you moved into a city where there was, at the time, one of the few communities in the U.S. I yeah. would say at the time there was San Jose. Mm-hmm. LA wasn't even a community nope. at that point. Um, you, had, you had a little Florida. New York. You yeah, you had Florida. a little New York. You had a little Florida and Texas. Yeah. There was a third, what, Third Coast Alliance, right? Is the mm-hmm. Sashamaru is mm-hmm. what started that. And there used to be TXT Tricksters, mm-hmm. right? Yep. G Dong and yeah. Victor and some of those guys. So crazy. Yeah. And um, I, I, w- when's the last time you went back and looked at old stuff of yourself? Ooh. It's been a while, right? It's been a while, probably. <laughs> Connor, pull up like the oldest one <laughs> we got. Him. <coughs> and what's crazy to me is like, uh, see if there's like 07 or something, maybe? I don't even know. Yeah, click that one. <laughs> click that. Oh, Dang, that's really old. That's super My old karate old. school. Yeah. Little kid. This is uh, this is old school with the trucker hat, too. Mm-hmm. That's how you that's know. A, super that's a. School. Hat that Tony Surfman drew. No way. Says I trick on it. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, back in the day when he was designing hats for people. No way. Yeah. That's crazy, man. And I, when I was looking through some of this stuff, I was like, holy crap, this is like insane to look back on, man. Um, all vert kicks right here, though. Yep. Going for it all. Just you know. <laughs> 
so crazy to think about that this is where like you know a lot of things stemmed from. Where we all started, man. Yep, all from just our just from in our little martial arts schools. Yeah, man. This is how it all started for so many of us, man. It's crazy. So to crazy. Think about. I'm doing. One trick at I a know. time. Two to butterfly you know, twists. Like, like <laughs> not even, not even really You're combinations. So you know, just know. let's do a singular trick. It's crazy. And so, at what point do you start training? Like when you took tricking seriously, um, you said gatherings around 05 and stuff like that. Yeah. How consistently are you training tricking at that point? At that point, it's six or seven days a week. Wow. So, sometimes multiple times. You know, I I was teaching at the karate school. So I was there all the time and, you know, whether it was 20 minutes before classes or after or whatever. Yeah. And then I started teaching at a gymnastics school just so that I could have access to the gym. Okay. So, you know, I was in these places all the time. So, it, you know, there was just, we were, I was training every day, trampoline in the backyard, grass in the front yard, karate school, gymnastics, yeah. you know. And there was not a lot of people in Texas, but there was four or five. So you could almost find someone to train with almost yeah. every day, especially because I had access to these places. You know, people would say, hey, people. hey, can we go train tonight? Yes. You you have access to the gym. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Damn. Um, That's crazy. And, like, I just got to ask this. What was it like training with Sesha Amaru back then? Was he always just outside the box, for lack of a better term, you know? Yeah, man. You know, and that – it's got to it's gotta be training with him that kind of segued the direction that I took, right? Because he was just – he was so creative and so different and, and just – Way ahead of, ahead his, of time, his time, man. Yeah, yeah. So ahead of his time. And I was curious if that had an influence on you because you very, very much at a certain point uh, started delving into your own style where like you were doing very unique transitions, a lot of like irregular stuff, a lot of mega landings when people sure. were doing megas and uh, obviously like king of the round off at one point. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah man. I mean, I think that um, at some point I just became fascinated with variations. Yes. Right. And I've, I've, yeah, it was just like, I didn't, there was a lot of tricks that I didn't invent, but then I went and ran with, right? Yeah. Like, like Danny Graham invented the Rocket Boy for sure. Totally. And then I was just like, let's see how many Rocket Boy things we can do. And there was a lot of things, you know, the, um, Steve, Tur- the, the Tirada Grab. Yeah. And then let's see where else we can put this and all these different things. And it was just like, all these people were coming up with really cool ways to do, you know, a singular trick. And I was just like, well, how can we, how can we expand on this and what else can we do with this, you know? Um, and so, yeah, variations always fascinated me, especially in a way that like, say you could do kick full or you can do full flash, right? They're like inverses of each other, which then led to like a fascination with combinations of, of things that are either really symmetrical throughout the thing, like say shuriken cutter, yeah, right? You do like a a front swing shuriken cutter, which is upright Mm -hmm. into like a B twist shuriken cutter into touchdown raise cork shuriken cutter. And you're, you're manipulating the same thing over and over and over again, totally. which then led to like a, a fascination with inverse things. Like one of my favorite combos I ever do was cheat nine hyper into snapu. Mm-hmm. It's the, it's the same cheat takeoff, but one time you go cheat twist snap kick hyper. And then the second is cheat takeoff kick hyper twist, right? You're just, you're doing the same motions just in opposite orders. Yeah. And you know, like shurikens and and side swipes they're they're just inverse moves and finding these ways to do combos that that show like that are either very similar throughout the whole thing or just completely opposite throughout the whole thing you know um i just became fascinated with stuff like that and i'm furious that i never thought i that little japanese kid that just did the touchdown raise shuriken cutter shuriken cutter (laughs) i was watching it and i had a little epiphany i was like it's just a um, All he did was put his leg up. No, it's um, helicoptero going the wrong yeah, way, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it was just one of those things. Like, how did I never think to helicoptero the opposite direction? <laughs> like, helicoptero is all round kicking. Yeah. Why didn't we think to do? The other you know. Leg, yeah. But yeah, that's those are the kind of things that I just became really obsessed with and passionate about. Is these things that are so similar, yes, but yet different, right? 100%. How can I do the same move over and over again? but make it different every time. There's an old story. I forget which gathering you're at when you were like teaching a workshop with somebody. And I swear like you, the kids or you, I think the kids asked like how many round off variations can you do? And I, time a lot. I know. And that's the story. I forget the number at the, at the time, the number was like 40 something. And you sure, said, it, and the kid like was that. like, what are you talking about? And you just started na- listing all of them. Yeah. At one point, I think I remember this, like at one point I had like over 25 double full variations or something. <laughs> right? And it's just like, 
Yeah, yeah I mean, there's just so many places to put things in it, though, right? Yeah. And then now all these kids are doing all these triples and stuff. They have a whole nother... They're skipping another all Another segment yeah. to keep putting things in, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, they could, could, that they can do incrementally from one to two and between two, two to three. Two and three is so many more. So and they're doing things. it, too. That's the crazy part. Yeah. You know? Absolutely insane. The, the, the triple got so good now that they're able to do the variations in it, yeah. right? Think, I just think back, like, how consistent you had to have double full to start doing things. To do a variant. To do one variation, but then to do two variations in it and stuff. And you know, these guys are doing double snap boos and yeah. just insane stuff. In, insane stuff. Now, of all the tricks that you've been credited with, um, what, what are some of the ones that you do take credit for? Would you take credit for, like, McDirty or? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. You think back, like, there's some things that you think you were the first person to do, and then it's like, oh, maybe not. Um, yeah. But, like, the Iron Man I was going to ask you if you take credit yeah. for Iron Man. I also take credit for the one and a half Arabian, which got yes. nicknamed Filipino yes. by yes. Sesh and Jeremy, but I'm pretty sure I did it before them. I'm pretty sure <laughs> you were the first one, too, to do that but, one. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. You know, it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, Mick Dirty. Yeah. Um, I think... Those are the only ones that, like, I think were super Stand original out. to me yeah. that weren't, like, drawn from somewhere else. Or just, like, a sing- like like you said, the, you kind of don't even count all the variants you could do of the cart full moves. Sure. You're just, like, like it's cart full fela. You can't, yeah, yeah. Like, I really enjoyed, like, one and a half twisting Rocket Boy. Yes. Which is also almost like a, a Filipino variation. Like, you're taking now, like, this vertical twisting thing because you kind of have to do that to get your Rocket Boy out. Yes. Um, Lone Star? Oh, Yeah. That that was a combination of me and Sesh. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. But, yeah. Kids, look up these moves if you know <laughs> what I'm talking about. I'll put some of them on the screen, but look them up. You need to know, you need to know your history of these moves. Um, but, yeah, like a lot of things that, you know, I, other people are doing full twisting back handsprings before me. Yeah. Um, and full twisting um, Gumby thing. Yeah. You know, all, all those things other people are doing. A lot, of, a lot of things other people did first, and I just kind of, Came in and I was like, I, I like this. You yeah. Know? Yo, Connor, pull up the uh, tricks. See if there's the Trickstar video because it's funny you talked about that. One of my favorite combos um, from all of Trickstar. And if not, just Google. Uh, yeah, go into the middle of the battle. One of my favorite combos from all of Trickstar was this one. And it was the only combo you threw before you got hurt. <laughs> combo one before uh, combo it was, two. It was probably the best. Iron Man I ever did. <laughs> it, honestly, this made all the trailers for Trickstar. And if you guys watch Trickstar Season 1, you know this combo I'm talking about right here, which is round one, you versus Kyle Cordova. I wanted the Battle of the Kyles. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted you guys to do irregular stuff. I knew it would be cool. Uh, and this combo right here. One of the best combos of the entire series. And uh, I was like, oh, man, this thing started out lit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then it went south real quick and then it for went me. South but, real yeah. quick, yeah. And what happened? You uh, you pulled your going on the Hyper Nine. Yeah, so you know, for like seven years or however long this has been, five, four or five years now, I've been yeah. like, yeah, it really hurt my groin on that. And it was brought to my attention, I don't know, a month ago, that I probably hurt my adductor and oh, not my groin. Not your groin. Your <laughs> but adductor. I, I never, I never went and got it looked at or anything. I was just like, oh, this hurts, you know. And forever, I just been like, yeah, my groin and. And somebody said something about how their adductor hurts. And I was like, oh, yeah, what? What does that do? And I was like, oh, like a, like a round <laughs> kick or a hyper in cycle. That's probably how I hurt myself. That's what you did, man. I was so bummed that you got hurt on this. I didn't want to see anyone get hurt. But yeah, like, yeah. at that time, I felt like your tricking, though, was ki- That was. You, you, were, you, were, you were training was, a lot. Yeah, I was training. You, I was you, training a lot and tricking. I was focused on stunts but I wasn't really working in stunts yet so I still and I mean I was still teaching at jam at the time so yeah. I was in the gym and this is this back was when shortly you. after or during living with Ryan Remfer who I was, was who say, was a fucking machine for Remfer training sessions. right and that that I mean yeah that relationship I think really like kind of kicked something in me to, to really start training harder yeah you know he was he was an animal he was in the morning session and the night session and just going super hard one of the fastest trickers of all time oh man like if you guys don't know who ryan remfer is go look him up speed demon dude like (laughs) furious tricks dude like insane um but around that time it was kind of crazy because what year did you officially move down to los angeles i think 2012 wow it's crazy to think about it seems like it was a long time ago but in relative terms it wasn't that long ago at all um 
pretty crazy to think about. You did make it to the White Lotus uh, closing gathering, though. I did, yeah. So we did get to see you there. Which was 11 or 10? I think so, yeah, 2011, yeah. Mm. And then transitions into 12, which is crazy. Um, before we, like, segue into, like, your modern-day tricking, like, just to talk about the times back when you were creating and doing all these tricks and stuff like that, was there anyone that influenced you outside of locally training with Sesh, or who did you watch for inspiration? Yeah, I mean, there's the obvious answers are Daniel Graham and Anise and Jeremy, because those guys were, you know. During our generation, yeah. Yeah, they were a driving force. Um, But I think Ott. That's what I, okay. That's what I was curious about. Ott was ahead of his time, I think, with his transitions. And, you know, he was doing megas and semis and, you know, true front swings. When everyone else was doing carry throughs and wraps, Ott was already doing true front swings. Yes. Um, And he just, you know, man, his old videos were so ahead of their time. His transitions were ridiculous. And he was doing power moves and all of it, you know. A hundred percent. Landing you know? with dubs and stuff when yeah. you weren't expecting it. He did the the four seasons or whatever they're calling it way before anyone else. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Ot Ot was something. Okay. Um But then also like Mogwai and some of those guys, you know, that just had unique styles. Mogwai was a powerhouse for how big he was. Sure was. Super big powerhouse. Mm-hmm. I th- he uh, he killed it at the Dreadnought Battles in New York that mm-hmm. one year. That really put him on the map for a lot of people, which is insane. And then I got to ask you about this, too, because this is a guy that gets slept on a lot of times, especially in modern day. Uh, what was it like training with Kite? Oh, dude. That was great. You know, I would, I would, that was cool. I'd go pick him up from his house after school. I think he was still <laughs> like in intermediate school or something. And we would, we would drive to the local high school and jump the fence to get on the football field. Wow. And just go train or, you know, train at uh, the gym. And he was, man, it's interesting to train with him. Um, and I imagine this is how a lot of those power guys are. He could sit there and just drill something for hours and hours and hours. And it's impressive how many times he could do it. Yeah. And, like, I, I never swang out of a double because I didn't want to take the time to do to, to train it. You know, like, there's a lot of moves that I did once and then just was like, did it and moved on, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, but these kids like kite or anybody that's doing these insane power move combos, like the, the amount of times that they just sit there and rep out double cork. I'm like, ah, good for you. <laughs> for real. Yeah, <laughs> that's, for real. that's good for you. I'm going to, I'm going to do something <laughs> that I find to be slightly more stimulating. Yes. Like a, but yeah, um, training with kite was, he was always on. He was he never had a bad session. Yeah. And he was fast. <laughs> He's so fast. He's so it's, fast. It's so funny that you trained with him, and then when you moved to L.A., you trained with Remfer. He's because in my fast. opinion, they're both so fast, yeah. yeah. When they rip and start catching momentum, it's like, get out the way. Because, yeah. Yeah, because you're going to get taken out. <laughs> exactly. That's crazy, man. And Kite's put out some really cool samplers of you over time. He's put out some samplers of everyone. Yeah, that yeah just he's like, got some nice tributes. That yeah, he's done. some of the ones, the ones of Jeremy I love. The one yeah. of Anise is so dope. Um, yeah, it's crazy, man. And so you moved down in 2012 and we kind of talked about you before you fully broke into stunts. You were really, I guess at that point, your tricking was probably what you were focusing on the most of that yeah, point. For sure. Because yeah. I mean, originally in moving to LA, the thought was, oh, I want to trick yeah, and you know, yeah, do yeah. these things. And so I was training really hard. Um, yeah, to, to do live shows and do these different things and do these different things. And then, um, then I, then Jeremy Marinas was like, hey, you want to do stunts? Like, you're going to need to do some other things. And started showing me how to fight and do these other things. And I started to enjoy that as well, you yeah. know. Um, so it became a little bit less about the tricking and more about learning to do stunts. Which is crazy. Do you ever miss the tricking? Yeah, sometimes. I was going to ask yeah. you that. Still trick sometimes, you know. I know. I saw but a random random clip on the grass the other yeah, day. Yeah, you know. Um, but yeah. I asked that because, you know, Connor, pull up the throwback video. Um, I saw you post a, a an old video recently, and I was like... From Jam? Yeah, yeah. from Jam. That um, was right in the, the height of the... In the, the mixing training, all, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm pretty sure Remper's in the background of this somewhere. I know. <laughs> just crazy to look at that uh, back then it was just go to Oba Gym, smash the tricks, and then go home. <laughs> yeah, and then come back later to teach. Exactly. Or, or to train some and more. And smash more tricks that night. <laughs> 
so crazy. And then of all the videos that you've put out, cause like you do actually have like an extensive amount of videos still on your channel. Is there one of the videos that stands out in your mind um, or a favorite video over your tricking journey? Cause I have two videos, but I, I want to get your take and then I'll tell you what my favorite videos of you are. You know, I think the, the last one I ever put out, which wasn't even really complete, I, it just kind of like ends partway through. Yeah, yeah. But it was like, it was, it was when I was into power moves, kind of. Yeah, they go, weren't to, go to his channel. The power go moves to. as other people, but like a lot of gyro knives and snafus and things in it. And, and, um, yeah, I, I like that one. And I go back and watch it sometimes, and there, there's some combos in there. But also the, the concrete one that I was we did with say. Remfer and Stephen Rennie. Um, Concrete one is a super banger yeah, one. That was weird too. I'd just gotten off a flight from China where I had learned in, we were doing a live show and I was like, I'm going to do a double cork in this. I'd never done double cork on concrete before. No and then way. all of a sudden I was like, oh, I can do this. And me and Ryan went to like a basketball court and just started doing really hard, well, you know, not, but harder moves on concrete. And then Steven came in like the next day. He's like, let's go shoot something. And I was like, yeah, let's. In that video, I do cork double leg twists for the first time ever so. on concrete. I don't think I've ever done another cork double leg twist, but I did it in the middle of Santa Monica. I was just like, right yeah, side. I'm going to do this. And Ryan was like, you don't do that move. And I was like, yeah, it's, just, it's all right. Yeah, it's so funny because, yeah, I, this is one of the ones that stands out in my mind as well because it was just like all concrete tricks, which is very rare in our sport. It, like you see a lot of grass, you see a lot of sand, you see a lot of beaches. A lot of spring floor. I feel like we're seeing more concrete now. Now, uh, a little bit. A little yeah, bit. A little bit. But yeah. But yeah, yeah. It's not an ideal place to trick, let's be <laughs> honest. <laughs> so, I know, right? The transitions. And then the other video that in my mind stands out. Connor, see if it's on the list. I'm not sure if I pulled it or not. Um, oof. <gasps> Connor's over here freaking out on the concrete <laughs> tricks. Um is there, is there a New York one or like a Brooklyn Zoo one on there? Oh, that was a good session. This is one of my favorite videos of you, and it's not on your channel. Who's this, Mike McGuire's uh, channel? Mike McGuire made it. Yeah, watch, yo, Connor, watch this video. Start it again and watch the first transition that we missed. Here we go. I mean, it was right <laughs> when, um, it was right when Dan Perez had explained megas and semis to me. It was around this time. Yes. You know, and it was, that's when things were starting to click. Transitional. You know, Dan, Dan was, Dan doesn't get enough credit for the things that he figured out because he wasn't the one doing them. He does you know, not. But he, but he unlocked a lot of things sure did. in the tricking universe through his thinking process. It's nice to see <sighs> that, that now people are finally getting his, his transitions, you know. Yeah. They're we're now finally seeing all four swings. Yeah, you're right. And like. I was thinking about it on the drive over that one of the things that is unique to tricking is this whole one legged thing, right? I think of that all the time when and, I talk to gymnasts. Yeah. And uh, not only are there super impressive things happening, like triple twisting backflips off one leg, which is like. There's quad twisting backflips off one leg. Yeah. <laughs> and corking back out, to, you know, stuff off one leg and totally. from J steps and, you know, ridiculous stuff. But totally. The thought that, you know, that they're, they're doing all of this without a round, you know, something really unique. Um, but. The fact that now everyone's not just doing gain or you know, not just backswing yeah. off your left leg, you know, and even backswing off the right leg wasn't. But now we're seeing true semis and mega swing throughs and stuff, and true like front swings. And because the the swinging and the one leg thing is so unique to tricking, it needs to be explored, and I think it finally is. You know, the the kids these days are doing some insane things. Insane things. Talking about the one legged stuff. Did you see Zen Kajihara? And Which his one? uh cork in, he did uh or full, he did back, full out back out swing one through. leg. <laughs> yeah. And swung through. Yeah, I sure did. Yeah, it's insane. <laughs> it's super insane. <laughs> it's crazy. What's really crazy is that over the weekend, um, Andrew Court at a tricking gathering in Florida landed the world's eighth snatch cannon, corking back out. And then the next morning, Zen landed the ninth in the world. And it was just like that fast that uh <laughs> Who did the J-step one? Uh, Stepan Burketov. That was insane. Yes. He even uh, messaged me and was like, this is the right way to pronounce my name because I know you're going to show it on your <laughs> clip show. <laughs> and I was like, you are correct, sir. You will be on the jam breakdown. So thank you for texting me how to say your name. 
Um, the, yeah, that blew my mind. Yeah, I mean, the other day we watched the the full end swing, yeah. and I was just like, and surprisingly, the cork was better than the gainer. It was it was way better, and yeah. I was like, dude, if he catches that right, he'll double cork that yeah, for insane. sure. Yeah, soon, very very soon, we'll see it. You Super know, I easily. Think. Uh, but yeah, how how insane is that? How strong is his left leg, dude? I don't get it. I, and you watch it. I, I mean, it's it. it's perfect. Yeah, he doesn't yeah. jump like the. There's no wasted momentum or energy anywhere, right? And that's that's what's interesting about doing like these high level swing stuff is like you don't necessarily just you don't want to go too like you want especially when you're doing gainers or whatever. Right? There's a nice consistent height that helps you go. 100%. You don't want to go too high or too low. So to like I don't know, you just watch him. He does his cartwheel and then this full in, and it's just it's it's all the perfect, perfect landing, you know. Yeah. And it's so new that it's going to get better. But yeah, I mean it's. Super impressive. And that kind of answers my question, which is like for someone of your generation, do you watch the new and current stuff? Which obviously you are if you're seeing Zen in them. Throwing. Yeah. I mean, I, I follow a couple of them. Okay. Um, and then jam repost stuff all the time and other people repost stuff. And yeah, I don't, I don't follow it as much as I used to, obviously. But yeah, I mean, I'm seeing new stuff and I'll watch gathering videos and, you know, yeah, it's insane what they're doing though. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely insane. <laughs> Uh, what what do you think is the next is the two questions? What do you think is the next step or uh, s- wave that tricking should head towards? You know, like mm-hmm. as far as a stylistic viewpoint, where do you think it should go? Uh, and then secondly, where would you take it if you were still tricking right now? Because like they could be different answers, they could be sure. the same answer, but uh, I I think they're similar for me because but I you know I'm I am excited that this wave of over the top power moves seems to be going away and it's great. We, we found some limitations now of, or we've expanded the boundaries of what we thought was time, real. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there was this long time where it was just all about like triples and quads and all this, and they're still relevant, you know? Um, but now there's the variations that are coming into them. That just comes with them repping the shit out of those so that they could do the variations. Right. Totally. Um, but I do enjoy, I, I see a shift coming. And it's more about these creative combos and these different ways of, of getting in and out of their moves. And, you know, there's, they're doing ridiculous combos now that end in ridiculous moves. And I, it's very pleasing to me. I, I enjoy it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I think, I think the direction is exactly where it's going though, is cool. they're, they're being creative and still using the power moves. And it's, it's not just gainers and corks anymore. Like I said, they're starting to use the front swings yes. and these different things that are, you know, just so much more unique than than just yik, 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 you know. Um, and I think that if I was still tricking, that's what I would want to do. I would want to just continue to be creative with things, you know. And I think they're doing it. Yeah. There's, you know, we used to always talk about a long time ago when this huge wave of just power came through and we're like you have no style you have no style you have no style and it comes down to like let's let's make it all silhouetted if i'm watching some, if i'm watching daniel graham trick just his shadow i know it's 100 i know it i know it i know it you know and there was a long time where there was just a bunch of clones you'd be like i, I could be anybody totally and i'm seeing a shift where now like if you went back to that you could you could pick out some of these young kids like I know exactly who that is I know exactly who that is you don't need to you know you can just tell by their style and their movement yeah I think we're getting a lot less clones and a lot more original people which is good yeah it's a super good thing for the sport and it's really cool that you have guys like you even you know brought it up earlier when Shosei did the uh, like touchdown with shuriken cutter it's cool that you have guys at the top of the power game doing the transitional moves and all of the like stylistic moves so which before like you said there was like two two different schools of thought. You were yeah. like a power head or your style yeah, head. Like, yeah. yeah. But uh, now we're starting to see the world's... Yeah, there's a bridge blend. happening there. It's very interesting to see. It's very interesting to see. And now what uh, What are your goals in like the immediate future right now? Are your uh, goals to just continue to work in stunts as a stunt double? Do you have goals of transitioning further in that career or... Um, eventually, but not in the too near future. I, w- I want to do a lot more performing. Yeah. Um, it's where the money's at. <laughs> <laughs> well, also selfishly, like you want to, you want to, yeah. you want to be the person on screen, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, I see a transition happening eventually, and I'm starting to, with my friends that are already in those positions, trying to learn these things so that it's not just like, oh my god, what have I stepped into? Um, but I'm in no hurry to hang up the performing hat. 
Yeah. You know. Which is cool. There's some of us that are ready to hang it up sooner than others. I sure. have a business partner in Aaron Tony who has no desire to hang it up. He wants to be in the suit till the day that he can't walk anymore. Dude, you know? I just ran into Rich Citrone. Yes. Who is still crushing it and like. Still killing it. Still killing it. He was on yeah. my first movie run of all time. And still to see him out there doubling and killing yeah. it is absolutely insane. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't think I want to perform forever. I don't think that that is. I don't think I'm like those two that want to do it forever, but I know that there's still a lot more that I want to do. Yeah, 100%. And one of the things that we don't really like venture into all the time with like all of our friends on here and stuff like that, but uh, I just want to kind of like touch on it briefly just to show uh, the kids out there in the community listening that like there's a lot more to life than just uh, doing the tricks and making the movies and stuff. But like from a financial standpoint, you've made like a lot of wise decisions over the last few years that... Uh, I've been like super proud of to watch and get to, to see. Um, I know at one point you had invested in like a little like yeah. auxiliary cord yeah. company that uh, you guys would, it, it was like a, a keychain for dongles, right? Yeah. Yeah. Basically yeah. Yeah, a little right, right when they came out with the, they got rid of the headphones yes. uh, plug on all the phones right now. You need an adapter. And it wasn't even really me. Um, when I moved to LA, two of my friends moved from Texas with me. One of them, one of them is an audio engineer yes. and it was totally his plan. He was like, look, this is this thing. And, and I was like, yeah, let's do it, you know? And that was an interesting learning experience in it. We, you know, worked with factories in China to build these molds and do these things. And, and we made them and, and we sold a bunch of them. And then we decided that we didn't really want to do that anymore. But <laughs> it, was, um, it was an interesting experience, lessons, you know, and yeah. it, was, it was fun. Super cool. It was, yeah. And then most recently, like we kind of touched on at the beginning of the show, you just started getting into uh, just obtaining properties to live in or rent them out. Yeah. And you have two properties in Atlanta right now. Yep. Uh, one of which you like pretty much rent out all the time. Right? Yeah, my, my first house that I bought there, you know, I bought it thinking that I was going to live there. Yeah. We, we had been in Atlanta so much that it was like, all right, this is where we're going to be. And two months after I got it, I never went back to Atlanta. Yeah. And so it was kind of this moment of, all right, now what do you do with it? Um, and yeah, I've just been renting it out, you know, mostly to industry stunt friends and stuff. And, um, that worked out well for the last two years. And I actually found myself in a predicament earlier this year that I was going to Atlanta and all of my rooms were rented out. Yes. And I was like, I have nowhere to live when I get there. <laughs> and I started thinking, oh, maybe another place. And I spent a while looking and then I, I finally last week found another place. And so now, yeah, now I have two. Probably do the same thing with that. Rent that one out. I won't have any rooms. I'll get, you know, maybe get a third or <laughs> something. Get out. another one. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> so it's a fun cycle, though. That's yeah. super cool, man. No, it's super cool to see just like the the growth in all of us. You know, like ten years ago, uh, to be thinking that we'd be sitting here having that conversation and stuff seems like it would have never happened. You know, mm -mm. it's absolutely insane to think about. But time's flying, and we're getting older, and. Times are changing. They sure are. <laughs> it's absolutely insane, man. And so, uh, you know, as we continue to progress, like over the next few years, and like you said, you still want to keep performing and stuff like that. Um, do you think that you'll spend most of your time here in Los Angeles or do you think you'll spend your time back in Atlanta? Do you have a... Uh, I don't know. That, that's okay. a tough one, right? Because you never really know. I um, just asked because we've also been talking about moving to Austin. Yeah, Austin would be fun. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. I, I find um, that currently I'm gravitating, gravitating towards Atlanta. Um, and I think that there's something about Atlanta that just kind of reminds me of Texas. Yeah. Um, the people are super nice and the, the industry is there, but it's not huge there. Um, and so it's like a nice change of pace, especially like you get off a big job for like seven months or whatever, and you're, you're traveling the world and doing all this stuff, and you're really just around all these industry people. And then to come back to LA, where it's still just more industry people, totally. like it's a nice break, I think, is why I like Atlanta. Um, and then, yeah, Austin would be amazing. But it's like we've talked city. about, there's just not enough work there. Yeah, not consistently enough. Yeah, you know. it'd be a cool getaway. Um, but I, I still plan to, I mean, I, I still love LA, so I don't, I don't plan to ever really leave. But, you know, it all just depends. Depends where you the know. calls come. The, the last the, the last two movies we did weren't even in America, really. You know, Tenet was some. Hobbs and Shaw was all London. Tenet was most of Europe. So I think the next one I'm doing is going to be a, a world traveler as well. So I'm not really trying to make roots anywhere, it's, I guess. It's crazy to think about, right? Absolutely insane. And so for, like, kids out there that are listening to us right now, like uh, kids that are trickers or stuff like that, what advice do you have for them for someone that's, like, trying to break into our industry? Because I feel like everyone has their own little tip or a little bit of knowledge that may, you know, hit someone else differently. 
do you have any advice for kids looking to get into our industry? I think um, you just need to be open to the idea of change, right? Because I really thought that all I wanted to do was trick. And I learned very fast that I do love tricking, but there are other things. And these things that I never thought I would be doing are now what I'm doing. Had had I been closed-minded and just been like, no, I'm just going to trick. That's all I want to do. I wouldn't be any, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today. Yeah. And then this isn't a question I've asked a lot of people. I've, I've asked coordinators more so, but for someone like yourself that gets to work on these movies, you've worked on the Avengers franchise. You've worked in the John Wick franchise, right? Uh, you've worked on all of these movies like Hobbs and Shaw. W- what advice do you have for someone that's already a current performer that isn't necessarily working on these big projects? Like, is there a skill set you think they should hone in on or anything in particular that they should do in order to elevate themselves? Yeah, I mean, I think you just got to you got to find where your your strong areas are yeah. and really market yourself for that but then find where you're weak and work on those um but also really like you just got to get out there and meet people yeah right you could be the best person for the job but the coordinator doesn't know who you are guess whose phone's not ringing right you know and it seems but like you just got to you got to get out there and meet people and and not even hustle them just get to know them, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. Like, you know, yeah. It's a it's an interesting game that we live in because there aren't auditions and stuff. It's it's all relationship based. Right, it is. Yeah. So it absolutely is. And it's all about like, yeah, you gotta you gotta know the coordinators. Yep. Hundred percent. And even you know, because even I find all the time I put people's names in for things and the coordinator doesn't know them. Either they gotta take my word for it or yeah. they just, you know. Yeah. And then sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just gotta, I gotta get out there and meet people, and then, and then just be patient, be ready, right? Like I think that's the biggest thing is, like, train really hard to be ready for when you get the opportunity. Yes. Right. Because yeah, yeah. if the opportunity comes and then, and then you shit the bed, well, yeah, you're screwed. It's like what they say, like luck is when opportunity meets preparation. Like yeah, you exactly. gotta be ready for the calls, and and you kind of touched on an important point, which is like, yeah, sometimes coordinator has to like take your word for it if they don't know somebody so it's like you just need to know as many people as possible so if you don't know them someone else can vouch for you Mm -hmm. i was on a set last week where uh i was on ncis la and uh, people came and hustled and uh dropped off their headshots and stuff like that and uh tugs even said like he said thank you uh i don't really hire a lot of new people i hire the people that i use all Mm -hmm. the time because i know i can trust them and, uh, and those words, like, are very true to a lot of coordinators. Uh, and so if you're out there and you're listening to this and you don't know a lot of coordinators, that is partially why you're not working a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's frustrating, right? Yeah. Like, especially when you're trying to, to break in and it's just like, well, they just keep hiring their friends. Or these, you know, I'm, I'm better for the job. And it's like, well, pump the brakes, relax. Yeah. It's not, you know, in the beginning, everything's so life or death, right? Like, yeah. I got to get this. I got to get this. There's lots of opportunities. There's lots of movies. There's lots of TV shows. Be patient. Train hard. And when you, you know, when you get that opportunity, just go crush it. Yeah, 100%. There's more work now than there ever was with all the streaming platforms and all these new things. So, yeah, just got to be ready. And uh, and you never know, right? You might find that one, like, that guy might carry, you might, for your whole have career. a huge career from that one person. So just be patient and yeah, don't get frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because it is it's super yeah. frustrating. Make, make and you're like, you're like, I don't, you know, you need credits to work. Well, I can't get any credits because I need the credits to work. You know, it's like yeah. just make friends, not enemies. Yeah. yeah. hundred percent. Well, that's super cool, man. And, uh, you know, one of the questions that I always ask everyone for, we get out of here, but you know, not all of them have an answer is, um, where do you see yourself in the next five years? And then where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? And uh, is there anything that over the course of your journey that you would have like changed to get to this point? Or um, has it all just been part of the process, you know? Yeah, I don't think I would change anything. Um, yeah, because everything, yeah, everything was a part, everything was a learning experience or, you know, whatever. Um, but in the next five years, I, still performing but transitioning in something into coordinating possibly and then for 10 years depending on how that transition goes either continuing to do that <laughs> or um you know like uh, i find a passion in food right now yes and i wouldn't mind owning a restaurant or something like that and i think at some point i'd like to segue into like 
having some restaurants or something. But I don't know. You know, I mean, it's not a lot of thought that's gone into that yet. <laughs> but it's a, it's a, it, there, there is some thought that goes into it. You know? Yeah, yeah, totally. That's something I've thought about as well. So maybe we'll collab down the road. <laughs> <laughs> Figure it out. So instead of wasting all of our money on it, we just waste it at our own restaurant. Yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah, super cool, man. Well, no, I appreciate you coming by, dude. Like yeah, I tell man. all of our friends, like, hopefully this isn't the last time we sit down. Yeah. Hopefully we, like, sit down and touch base. Uh, I know you're about to take off soon out of town on Tuesday. Tuesday you're to back Hawaii. back to Atlanta. Oh, Hawaii. Hawaii. Correct. Are you allowed to say what show you're going to go work on? I'm going to work on Magnum. All right. And I, I mean, I don't yeah. see why I can't say. I'm going to go double Cowboy Cerrone, apparently. So Heck yeah. Hopefully that actually happens before this airs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, but either way, man, it's super cool to see. And uh, it's just, you know, proof that, like, the journey never stops. And uh, thanks for making the time when you were here for this limited amount of time in L.A. Hey man, so. thanks for having me. It's great. Yeah, it's crazy, man. So, uh, yo, before we get out of here... Um, if you can, look into that camera. Just let people know where they can stay up to date and follow the journey. Wait, what? Just look in that camera and tell people where they can follow you online. Like oh. your socials and your oh. stuff. Like um, that. Fuck, what is my... Um, <laughs> I think my Instagram <laughs> handle is McCleaner710. <laughs> and that's probably the best way to keep up to date with what I'm eating. Because that's all I post on there. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much, man. Now, we'll be sure to put it on the screen, too. So, it'll be all good. Um, and as always, guys, please be sure to hit that like button, comment, and subscribe for brand new episodes each and every week. Join us every Monday for Jam Breakdowns and every Friday for brand new Jamcast, interviewing influential members of the moon community like Mr. Kyle McLean himself. So uh, as always, guys, I got to give a very special shout out to Mr. Connor Simon for running the cameras in the Switcher app as always. I got to give a very special shout out to our sponsor, Inner West Hemp. Check them out for all your CBD needs and use the code JAM for 15% off. And I also got to give a very special shout out and thanks to our guest this week, Mr. Kyle McLean, for coming through. Thanks, man. Hell yeah. So as always, guys, coming at you, coming through, I'm your host, Travis Wong. Thanks for joining us here on another Jamcast. Until next time, see you all soon. Peace.